Okay. So good evening, everybody. It is a pleasure to have uh, Oliver Ross from uh, University of Würzburg. We'll be talking about the squeezing function <coughs> for finitely connected uh, planar domains. So, okay. Thanks. Yeah, so first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to, uh, to get a slot in the seminar. So I'm uh, talking about a joint work with uh, Pavel, who is among us today. And it's about the, the squeezing function, but for plane domains uh, and uh, concentrating on the finitely connected case. OK, so the, the talk is uh, consists of three parts. So in the beginning, I'm just uh, recalling some basic background and a little bit of the history of the squeezing idea and the, the definition of the squeezing function. Um, in the second part, uh, I'm uh, switching to the case of plane domains, in particular to the case of doubly connected domains, uh, because there's a very recent uh, paper out there by NG, Tang and Tsai uh, that just came out some uh, months ago uh, in Mathematische Annalen, where they uh, found uh, the, the squeezing function for doubly connected domains uh, using a very sophisticated machinery uh, which is based on the Leuvenat differential equation. So uh, the, the first goal of the of the talk is somehow to, to show you a, a, a different proof of this result, which is based on uh, just on some basic potential theory. And uh, the, the, the proof gives a little bit more information than uh, the, the result of NG, Tang and Tsai, uh, because it covers all cases of equality uh, also. And then in, in the final part of the talk, I'm uh, going to, to tell you a little bit about the problem for domains of connectivity greater than two. And in this case, uh, in Qi, Tang and Tsai, they came up with a, a conjecture in their paper that would cover all also these cases. But as we shall see, uh, that uh, it is possible to come up with a, with a counter example to their conjecture, which means that uh, the, somehow the natural conjecture for the squeezing function for domains of connectivity greater than two is unfortunately not true. And it seems even difficult to come up with a good conjecture in this case, but I hope uh, uh, we will see this in the, in the course of the talk. Okay, so Let's start at the beginning. So the, the squeezing idea goes back to some uh, celebrated work of Liu, Sun and Yao uh, in uh, 2004. And uh, the origin of this uh, work is again some one dimensional problem. Um, so they were interested in the complex geometry of Teichmuller spaces of a compact Riemann surface. And specifically, they were interested in comparing the Karadeodori, Kobayashi and Bergman matrix there. And the main goal, uh, the main tool, I'm sorry, is a celebrated result of Lippmann bears from the 1960s, the so-called bears embedding theorem. Uh, and this result uh, roughly speak assess the following. So uh, call this a uh, Teichmuller space just omega for uh, simplicity. And uh, this uh, space has the so-called uniform squeezing property uh, if this condition that you can see here holds. So the condition says that there are some constants A and B positive, so that if you uh, take any point at P in the Teichmuller space omega, you find an embedding of this uh, space into a CN that sends the point P to the origin, and in such a way that the image domain of this embedding is somehow squeezed between two Euclidean balls about the origin, the outer ball with radius B and the inner ball with radius A. And the important point here is that those constants A and B do not depend on the choice of this base point P inside the, the Teichmuller space. Okay, and in this way, of course, uh, you can think about this uh, Teichmuller space just as a a domain uh, in some CN, then this embedding gets holomorphic. And then you can speak about uniformly squeezing domains just as domains in CN that have exactly this property here, right? 
So uh, Liu, Sun and Yao, they somehow isolated this uh, uniform squeezing property and then they proved the following very nice result uh, in particular. So they showed that if you have a domain in CN which is bounded and uniformly squeezing, then in fact those three uh, canonical metrics uh, on this domain, Karadeodori, Kobayashi and Bergman are equivalent. So it's a very a very nice property of those domains. And uh, this work of Liu, Sun and Yao, I mean, created a lot of other papers in the in the sequel. So um, people in particular got interested in the question which domains are uniformly squeezing. And well, there are some partial results out there and I just want to mention two of them. Namely, uh, it is known that uh, uniformly squeezing domains are pseudo convex but the converse is not true, and there is a counterexample by Klaas Dieterich and John Eric Van Es. So, uh, characterizing or giving conditions uh, so that the domain is uniformly squeezing seems to be a quite difficult problem. So, uh, people uh, try to approach this problem by introducing uh, a concept which is now called the squeezing function of a domain. So, let's take a look at this concept. So this goes back to, as far as I know, to uh, a work of Deng, Guan and Sun in 2012. And the definition is, is the following. OK, so you, you fix a domain omega in CN, assume that domain is bounded, say, then you take a point set in the domain. And then you are looking at all holomorphic embeddings of this domain uh, into, some, into CN. And uh, you assume that the image domain of F is contained in the open unit ball of CN and the map sends the point set to the origin. So it looks like this. OK, then, of course, uh, there is a, a ball about the origin of some, say, maximal radius, uh, which uh, sits inside the image domain of this function F. So the number A is uh, exactly the distance of the origin to the boundary of the image domain. Okay, and then you take the soup over all those distances over all functions in this family. Okay, and this exactly gives you what is now called the squeezing function for the domain omega at the point set. So this is a function that associates to each domain omega and to each point set in the domain a certain non-negative number, which is uh, because the image domain is always contained in the unit ball, a number less or equal than one. And uh, of course, the question is now uh, how to find the squeezing function for a domain and what uh, properties can you use in order to study the geometric properties of the domain, say, in terms of the squeezing function. OK, uh, there are a couple of fairly simple properties of the squeezing function that are useful, but almost trivial to prove. So I, I just list a couple of them to in order to. Uh, to go ahead, so the first thing is this function is continuous, which is not difficult to prove kind of normality argument. Then um, you can easily show that the squeezing function of a Euclidean ball is always equal to one. This is essentially nothing but the Schwartz lemma. Um, one can compute, that's a little bit more involved, the squeezing function of the by disk. So this D here is the unit disk in the complex plane. And there the squeezing function is found to be one over square root of two. Okay, so in those simple cases, this, this, the squeezing function was known. Um, there's also a kind of rigidity property here. So if you have equality uh, for the squeezing function, so it takes the value one at one point in the domain, then this domain is actually biholomorphic to the unit ball. Uh, this again is essentially the, 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 this, the case of equality in the, in the Schwartz lemma. Uh, it would be interesting to, to, to look at some boundary condition of this form which also would guarantee that omega is biholomorphic to the ball. And then there's a very simple property, almost trivial to prove, namely uh, the squeezing function is a biholomorphic invariant. 
So meaning that if you have a biholomorphic map from a two bound domains, omega onto G, then the squeezing functions are related in the obvious way. Okay, so that's very simple and easy to prove. So if you combine all this in the case of a plane domain with the Riemann mapping theorem, then you see uh, if you have a, any bounded simply connected domain in the, in the plane, then the squeezing function is always equal to one. Uh, conformal invariance, uh, and just using the fact that the squeezing function of the disk is, is equal to one. Okay, so the simply connected case is is, is easy to, to, to handle. Um, so the interesting problems somehow uh, start to show up when the domain is no longer simply connected. But before uh, going to this, uh, let me just mention one very annoying property of the squeezing function. Uh, this guy is actually not monotone with respect to the domain. And this is makes it really hard to come up with uh, estimates for the squeezing function, because usually in function theory, I mean, many of those domain functions actually are monotone, but this is no, not true for the squeezing function. Okay, now uh, let's go to the doubly connected case. So, uh, just by conformal invariance, we can assume that the domain we are looking at is, say, just some standard annulus. So, uh, annulus centered at the origin, say, with inner radius r between 0 and 1, and we take the outer radius to be 1. And then, uh, Patrick and Chi, Tang and Sai, they, they produce this very simple and nice formula for the squeezing function of this standard annulus thereby solving the uh, squeezing function problem for, for the doubly connected case. Um, the difficult part in this theorem here is actually another result, which is uh, a kind of solution to a certain extremal problem. And uh, this is what I'm going to call theorem B, which is also a result by NG, Tang and Tsai. And um, this result is, uh, is the following. So, what you do is you start with a domain omega. You can see it here on the left. You assume the domain sits inside the unit disk, and you assume that the outer boundary of the domain is the unit circle, okay? just as in this picture. And you assume also that the origin belongs to this domain omega. And then uh, if you take a conformal map from a standard annulus onto this domain omega, so that the outer boundary, so the unit circle, goes to the unit circle, then you actually have this uh, inequality here. So the, the distance of the origin to the boundary of omega is always bounded from above by the absolute value of the pre-image of the origin under this conformal map phi. Um, this inequality is also sharp uh, it's easy to come up with a, at least a, one case of equality, namely um, equality holds if the domain omega has a very specific form. So the complement of this domain omega with respect to the disk is just an arc on a circle centered at the origin with the corresponding radius. So here's the picture. So this domain here is somehow the extremal domain in the problem of uh, estimating the distance of the boundary from the origin uh, for all domains satisfying the conditions of this theorem B. Okay, so uh, this is somehow the, the basic result they, they proved. Um, so the result is shown here again. So um, maybe just let me uh, indicate, uh, assuming theorem B, how uh, you can prove theorem A now. This is a fairly simple but somehow indicates the, the role of this uh, theorem B in the squeezing function problem, uh, I think, quite nicely. So, okay, so we assume a theorem B and we want to somehow find uh, the squeezing function for, the, for this standard annulus. Okay, by definition, we start with a holomorphic injective map from this standard annulus into the unit disk that sends, say, this given point set, say this is the point here on the right, uh, to the origin. Okay, uh, we call the image domain or, uh, just omega of this conformal map, 
And then just recall, a uh, squeezing function means we have somehow to maximize uh, the distance of the boundary of the domain omega uh, to the origin. Okay. So we have to make the domain at, inside the disk as large as possible. So uh, it's not difficult to, to see that just Riemann mapping theorem and the Schwartz lemma, that in this case, this the conformal map that somehow realizes this supremum here either has to map the outer boundary, the unit circle, onto the unit circle, or it has to map the inner boundary of the annulus onto the unit circle. Okay. So in the first case, unit circle goes to the unit circle. We are just in the situation of theorem B, so we can apply it. But in our case, the inverse of the origin under phi is just the point set. So this gives us this estimate in the first case. In the second case, if the inner boundary goes to the unit circle, uh, we can just uh, use a reflection. And this gives us the other uh, inequality, uh, so that the distance of the origin to the boundary of omega is less or equal than uh, r over the absolute value of z. So this distance is less or equal than the maximum of those two quantities, with which is already essentially the statement of, uh, uh, of theorem A, which says that you actually have equality here. So you just have to write down a specific domain where you do have equality, which is not too difficult to do. So this is somehow uh, the proof how theorem B implies theorem A. OK, so the important thing now is how to prove theorem B, so how to uh, find among all domains the, that one that maximizes the, 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 the distance of the origin to the boundary. Well, the uh, conjectured extremal configuration um, is uh, generated by this conformal map Psi, which always exists. So there is always a conformal map from the standard annulus onto a circular slit disk, mapping the point Z to the origin and the outer boundary to the outer boundary. That's a standard result in conformal mapping theory. And this map Psi, so this map on the right, is actually unique up to a rotation uh, about the origin. OK, and then to prove theorem B, uh, and Qi, Tang, and Tsai proceeded in two steps. So they proved in a first step that the distance of the domain on the left, so a uh, generic domain omega with these properties, uh, the distance of the boundary to the origin is always less or equal than the corresponding distance of this circular slit disk here on the right. Okay. And then in a second step, they computed for this circular slit disk just this distance uh, in terms of this conformal mapping, and combining these two steps immediately gives uh, the proof of this theorem B. So there is the splitting in these two steps. And actually, the second step is fairly easy to handle. There are a couple of approaches possible. So there is a paper by Reich and Warshawski where this result is already there. Uh, and Qi, Tang, and Tsai, they used the schottky klein prime function, which gives you a semi-explicit form, explicit formula for this specific conformal map Psi to uh, prove uh, this condition too. Um, but as we shall see in a second, uh, one can also use potential theory to prove the same the same result here. So the difficult part in the in the proof of uh, in Qi, Tang, and Tsai is actually step one, showing uh, this inequality. So uh, showing that uh, the circular slit disk is the extremal domain uh, in this in this problem. And for this, they used this intermediate uh, standard annulus there because they uh, use the Löwner equation, which gives a kind of parametrization of conformal mappings from an annulus onto a doubly connected domains. And with this machinery, they were able to, to prove that this inequality here in step one actually holds. OK, so let me just indicate that one can prove this inequality one uh, now also by some basic uh, potential theory uh, approach. But before, uh, telling you the proof of this theorem one now. Um, so I briefly go back to theorem B. 
So theorem one is exactly the theorem B with an infinitesimal improvement, namely uh, actually it identifying all cases of equality here in this estimate. Uh, except of that, theorem one is essentially the result of NG uh, tongue and psi. Okay. So there is a related uh, classical theorem which is uh, somehow similar to theorem one and it usually goes under the name of Reynolds inequality and it goes back at least to 1932 and it says that if you have the same conditions as in theorem one, so a conformal map of a doubly connected domain onto such a circular slip disk, outer boundary goes to the outer boundary, the origin goes to the origin, then the derivative of this map at the origin is greater or equal than one in absolute value. So this means somehow that the infinitesimal <coughs> uh, distortion of this map at, at G at the origin is at least uh, at least one. So uh, the map is at the origin infinitesimally uh, length non-decreasing. Okay. But the inequality of theorem one somehow says you're really looking at the distance of the origin to the boundary. So it's more of a global estimate but somehow of the same uh, of the same flavor. I'm, I mentioned that because um, Reynolds inequality actually is true for any finitely connected domain. So you have, of course, to replace this circular slit disk by uh, a, a, the unit disk, which where you remove a couple of arcs on circles uh, centered around the origin according to the number of connectivity of the domain, of course. OK, so now let's see how one can prove theorem one f f fairly easily. So what we just do is uh, we look at the harmonic measure of the boundary component uh, gamma of this domain omega. So that's just the harmonic function in omega, which is zero on the blue part and takes the value one on gamma on the red part. And uh, then there is a basic formula for this harmonic measure in terms of the so-called green measure of this uh, boundary component gamma. So this is a, a measure which is supported uh, on this set gamma. It's a measure on the disk. And uh, you can write the harmonic measure of this boundary component gamma just as the integral over gamma now the, un the, the Green's function here of the unit's disk, it's important, against this Green measure. Okay, uh, th this is not difficult to prove. Uh, it's essentially just the Reese representation theorem for the superharmonic function you get when you extend your harmonic measure function W uh, just to take the value one here on this white part. Okay, and then just use uh, the Reese representation theorem. Fairly, fairly easy to prove. Now, the total mass of the unit disk uh, of this green measure, mu gamma, uh, is a number which is called hyperbolic capacity. So these concepts, it's very well known that everything here is conformally invariant. So one can also compute the same stuff just using our conformal map G. Um, so the harmonic measure is conformal invariant and also this hyperbolic capacity is, is conformally invariant. Okay, one, one can prove actually this. So this conformal map G maps gamma onto this circular arc C here. Okay, so the, the, the notation is, uh, I think it's self-explanatory. Okay, and then what we just do is use the fact that G maps the origin to the origin and we exploit this conformal invariance of harmonic measure and write the formula down explicitly with the help of this representation in terms of the green measure and uh, the fact that we know the green's function for the unit disk. So what you get is just this equality here. Okay, so that's just the conformal invariance harmonic measure evaluated at the origin. And then everything is now extremely simple because you see the integral on the right, you, you integrate along a circle Okay, all points W on the circle have the same absolute value, namely just the, the distance of the circle to the origin. So you get this, uh, and using the fact that the measure mu C is supported on, on this arc C. Okay. You can do the same for the integral on the left, but not, 
not getting an e equality, of course, but you can estimate because W belongs to omega. Uh, so the absolute value is always let, uh, greater or equal than the distance of gamma to the origin. And using this, you get this inequality. Okay. And then uh, you can kick out the green measure of gamma and C because they are equal. That's this conformal invariance here. And what you get is the inequality of theorem one. And you also see uh, when equality holds, namely if and only if a gamma is actually a circular arc, that's the only uh, way you, you get equality here. Okay, so it's, it's fairly easy. And of course, uh, much of this argument actually works also for uh, domains, domains which are not doubly connected. But then of course, this final step breaks down and but you, you immediately see it, the difficulty if you want to pass to the higher connectivity case. Okay, so uh, a very kind of simple proof of this result. Um, to proceed, maybe I'm uh, recalling a classical result now. So we are going to proceed now to the cases of higher connectivity. And in this case, um, I want to recall something which is sometimes called the circularly slit the theorem. Okay, so the result says, if you have a, now a finitely connected domain omega, and you take just any of the non-degenerate boundary components of omega and call it gamma. Before, this was just the unit circle. And then you fix the just one point set in the domain omega. And then you look at essentially the same family of functions we have been looking at before. So you look at all holomorphic and injective functions from this domain onto the, yeah, sorry, into the unit disk mapping the specific point set to the origin and mapping this boundary component gamma onto the unit circle. Okay, and then if you take any function g in this family, then the following two conditions are equivalent. So that's classical fact. So g maps the domain omega onto a circularly slit disk, so onto this very nice canonical domain, if and only if the function g maximizes the derivative at the specific point set in absolute value among all functions in the family. Everybody knows this in the case of a simply connected domain because this is just the standard proof of the Riemann mapping theorem in this case. But the result is actually true for any finitely connected domain and it's a very old result going back to Kirby, I guess in the 1903 or so. But uh, if we now use what, uh, what we have seen before, if the domain is either simply or doubly connected, then con one can add a, a third condition here, namely the function g maps the domain onto a circular slit disk if and only if uh, it maximizes the distance of the origin to the boundary of the image domain. And that's essentially the result we have proven before. So one can add this condition C in the special cases, simply or doubly connected domain to this list of equivalent conditions. And now there is an unavoidable question. Uh, if, if, do we really need simply or doubly connected also in this condition C? As we shall see now, uh, the answer is uh, yes, we need it. So this condition C is no longer equivalent to B and A in all or at least in domains which are not simply or doubly connected. So one can produce a, an, an example of a triply connected domain where this condition is no longer equivalent. And uh, the construction somehow clearly shows that uh, it will also work in domains of higher connectivity. Okay, so this somehow breaks down. Okay, um, I was uh, I'm, I'm mentioning this question because if the answer to this question would have been yes, then this would have given a proof of a conjecture that has been made by NG, Tang and Tsai in their paper. So here's the conjecture they, they formulated in their, in their paper where they uh, produced the uh, squeezing function for doubly connected domains. So the conjecture is kind of natural. <clears throat> so you start with a finitely connected bounded domain omega in the plane, see the picture here. Um, and you denote the non-degenerate boundary components, say by gamma 1 up to gamma n. So here you see a triply uh, 
connected domain omega with three distinguished boundary components. And then you pick a point set in the domain, that's the green point here, and then uh, just using this circular slit uh, disk theorem I have shown, <coughs> you can map <coughs> this domain onto a circular slit disks, but you can do this in three different ways, because you can say which of the boundary components of omega should get mapped to the unit circle. You can map the blue part to the unit circle, you can map the red boundary component to the unit circle, or you can map the pink part to the unit circle. So you get three of these uh, functions, and um, they are unique if you say that the point set goes to the origin and the derivative at the point set is positive. And then the conjecture of NG, Tang, and Sai just says, uh, look at these domains of this specific extremal function and just uh, take that domain which has largest uh, distance from the boundary to the origin. And this, and that's what was the conjecture, should give you the value of the squeezing function for the domain omega. So in, um, in the case of doubly connected uh, domains, this is exactly the, the result they have proven in theorem uh, A, and which we have reproven in theorem one. Okay. So it's kind of natural, but I just want to use the, the time I have now uh, to indicate a construction which shows that this conjecture is already wrong in the case of triply connected domains. And the construction is in principle uh, not difficult, but it involves a, kind, a number of estimates which are rather technical, but I, I think I, I just try to show you the, the construction in pictures uh, to convince that the, you, that the construction is not too difficult and uh, leaving all the technical details aside. Okay. So here's the principal idea of this uh, construction. So of a, a proof that, or a, constructing a triply connected domain for which uh, this conjecture of NG tongue and Tsai is actually not, not correct. So, um, okay, so what we do is we start with a very specific function, namely uh, we start with a standard annulus. The inner radius R is fixed now, it, it won't change uh, in the sequel. And uh, as we have seen, there is a a map which is called canonical map of this standard annulus onto a, the unit disk which is slid along a circular arc uh, on a circle which is uh, centered at the origin in such a way that you can say that a prescribed point, we call it X0 now, and which we assume is on the positive real axis inside the annulus, is going to be mapped onto the origin. Okay, so the green point belongs to the domain and there is essentially only one such mapping uh, and you can kind of write it down in a semi-explicit way in terms of the Schottky prime Klein function, but there is such a map. Uh, it's, it's, it, this is the extremal map in the doubly connected case. Okay, and then what you do is we keep this point X not now and then we look at another point x, again on the real axis, but uh, a little bit less to the point x0. Okay, so this is this result here. So, and then we are using the same function, but um, now with the point x. Okay. So this function f sub x, uh, Okay, can, can you still hear me? I see something. Yes. Oh, okay, yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. So, yes. Okay, thank you. So, uh, this new mapping F sub X, okay, it maps now the point X, this pink point, to the origin and again maps onto a, a circular slit disk now with a different circular arc, C. Uh, with a different radius, but this arc is still uh, on a circle with, which is centered about the origin. Of course, the green point X0 is then mapped onto some other point, and in this case, actually on some point uh, on the negative real axis. Okay. So, and then what we just do is, 
um, we take now a conformal automorphism of the unit disk, which sends us this green point here, which is no longer at the origin to the origin. Okay, we call this automorphism just T sub X. So the image domain now looks like this. And this is still a disk with a circular arc removed. But now this arc is no longer on a circle with center at the origin. The center is different. Okay. And then we just look at the whoops at the corresponding map from the upper left to the upper right, and we call it just phi sub x. Okay. So x naught is fixed, the radius r is fixed, so the only variable that is uh, still there is the choice of our point x here. And of course, if you move x to uh, to the right to the getting to the point x naught, then phi sub x at in the limit will tend just to uh, the identity map. Okay, so we just look at this uh, mapping phi sub x, and uh, now what you see almost immediately is the following. <clears throat> so uh, because of uh, the result for the doubly connected case, we know that the distance of this red circular arc here on in the picture in the upper left corner is just uh, x naught. Okay, so the point x naught is, is just here on this red uh, red circle, part of this red circle. And then we perform this conformal map phi sub x as explained. And then this point is mapped to the image point, but this is a this image point is a little bit uh, farther to the right. That's not difficult to see. On the other hand, uh, Thinking about theorem A, we know that uh, the distance of this domain, so the distance of the boundary of this domain to the origin, has to be smaller than the distance of the domain on the left uh, to the origin, because this domain here is the extremal domain. Okay? This means that if you look at uh, this upper and lower end of this circular arc in the upper right corner, then these points, they have to move a little bit uh, closer to the origin. OK, so and then what we just do is we now produce out of this doubly connected uh, circular slip disk a triply connected slip disk. So we just uh, smuggle in here another very small circular arc. Uh, the point here of this pink uh, arc, you should think about this arc as being very close to the red part and to have a very small length. Okay, And then uh, it's getting mapped by phi x onto, well, some other uh, arc. And then what you get is on the right hand side a triply connected domain. So it's the unit disk where you remove this red circular arc, which is not centered at the origin, and this pink image domain of this uh, function phi sub x. Okay. And then uh, using this semi-explit expressions of all those mapping functions that are involved, one can now show that the following is true. You can choose uh, the number x, and the position and the length of this pink arc in such a way that the distance of the origin from the boundary of omega, which is a circular slit disk on the left, is actually less than the distance of the origin to the image domain of this function phi sub x. Okay. So this means we have produced a triply connected domain for which uh, the problem of maximizing the distance of the origin from the boundary is not given by a circular slit disk. Okay. And this, uh, at the end, uh, gives a counterexample to this conjecture of uh, NG, Tang, and Tsai. Okay. Of course, I mean, there is a uh, little bit or a considerable amount of work involved to, sh to show that it's actually possible that you can choose those parameters. But as I mentioned before, uh, this is possible because uh, for these uh, canonical mappings, I just go back, from a standard annulus to those circular slit disks, there are kind of explicit formulas, either in terms of so-called Villar kernel or uh, what, what is now known as the Schottky-Klein prime function. 
So you can actually even write down um, um, an, an explicit formula in terms of uh, an infinite product to, to get explicit expressions for those uh, conformal mappings. And that at the end actually makes it possible to, to show that uh, such a domain actually exists. Okay, so this is roughly the, the, the construction of this domain. And um, so this is essentially all I, ha I have to say. So the, the, the essence of this talk now is somehow uh, the, the, the insight that this may be the natural conjecture of how this uh, uh, squeezing function uh, for finitely connected domains look like. Namely, uh, the hope the extremal domains would be given by this circular slit arcs is no longer true. And now the good question is, uh, if, is there at all any sensible conjecture about how the extremal domain for the squeezing function problem for domains of connectivity are greater than actually two actually looks like? So we don't have a good candidate for that at the moment. OK, so thanks a lot for your uh, attention um, and listening. Thank you. Thank you. Are there uh, questions? I saw a raised, I saw a hand. Uh, was it? Someone raised the, the hand? No. Uh, so maybe, okay, Marco, please go ahead. Okay. Well, anyway, it's just a curiosity. You, you you say you computed the or it's at the very somewhat at the beginning this the squeezing function for the by disk. Is it on the also the formula for the poly disk, or is it a complicated computation that requires uh, when you, you were still in CN? Uh, oh, uh, this actually I don't know exactly. I mean, uh, I just. Uh, I had a quick look at these papers uh, for for the background on the squeezing function, uh, and there I found it uh, explicitly mentioned for the for the by disk. Okay, um, so yeah. Okay, no, because I was I don't know if one you, you also talked about the uh, the monotonicity that is failing. Yeah. What what would be the what the, the natural thing to expect that if the domain gets larger the squeezing function gets also larger. Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's, this is, you, you can already see this, uh, I mean, using a by disk and just the, uh, just some Euclidean balls in C2 to, to see that this monotonicity fails. So um, the point is that in other domain uh, functions, uh, like, uh, so in, in one variable case, like uh, Kobayashi or Karateodori metric or, you always have this monotonicity, so extremal lengths always this monotonicity, and this technique somehow gives you a, a, a tool to get estimates from below and from above by approximating your maybe difficult uh, your uh, complicated domain by simpler ones. I mean that's the the standard way how, to, for instance, to to get a good estimate for the Poincaré metric on the twice punctured plane. So uh, monotonicity is somehow the essential tool there and yeah yeah, so, yeah i agree yeah, yeah okay yeah. no it, it, sorry to, to see i don't want to, to but the fact that you pass from the the, the disk to the by disk and the, the squeezing the squeezing function is smaller mm -hmm. because uh so it seems to me that then uh, would be natural to 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 infer that uh, if you go to the to the poly disk in cn you will get something again smaller and that and that that it would be so, somewhat surprising that it decreases with dimension. That's yes, yeah. No, I think a uh, one over square root of two should be for any, because we are looking for, for the yeah. Because if you just look to the to if you shrink the the poly disk by one over square root of two, then you can put inside the ball and there is a, uh, I mean you have probably it's not you have the ball of radius. Oh, okay. uh, one of a square root yeah, of two, which is con contained inside, and that's I think is the the best also for uh, for the by disk for the poly disk. Yeah. That's I, I think is uh, 
Well, you, you can prove probably that uh, it's a, at least uh, one of a square root of two, and then I cannot okay. be bigger. Okay. Uh, Oliver, I have. Oh, Thank you. Um, yeah, maybe I can ask. Um, you mentioned exactly this one that the squeezing function I used to get estimates on metric. And uh, for instance, I, I found quite a surprise, but at least to me, it's not even now, that there are uh, uh, many, at least to me, unknown things for uh, um, multiple connected domain uh, about, for instance, Caratodori. Uh, metric or Caratodori distance and uh, also about gromofiberbolicity of those uh, distance and so on. So um, would you expect with uh, your kind of result to, to get something on uh, on this kind of metrics uh, or? Uh... Uh, well, uh, I'm not sure about if, if I mean, the, the, the point is that um, Actually, uh, as you mentioned, also for say triply connected domains, uh, I mean, also, uh, not not really a lot is known about uh, the Kobayashi metric there. Or so I mean, it's there's there are explicit formulas for the doubly connected domains as for the squeezing function, but somehow there it uh, I mean passing to this higher connectivity case is, is it's really something different. And the, the problem here is um, that we don't now even have a good candidate what how the squeezing function should look like. Or what is the extremal configuration that gives rise to the to the squeezing function? You see, um, so I'm a bit pessimistic if uh, if it's possible to to really get uh, uh, precise information about the, the, the squeezing function in this case. I mean, you know, there are some uh, questions in in function theory like the univalent block functions. Uh, block radius, uh, so there is not even a conjecture for this number out there. I mean, so uh, it's not clear. I mean, uh, one somehow should expect that, the, in a sense, the most symmetric situation would give you the extremal case, but maybe it's no longer true here already in the triply connected case. So I'm um, I'm a bit pessimistic that uh, that with this approach you 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 get. Uh, you get information about Kara Deodori or Kobayashi metrics also for multiply connected domains, but that's just the uh, that's what I think at the moment. So, on. but I, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Thank you. The other questions? Did you some append? I didn't see. No. Okay. Well, let's. Thank our speaker again. Thank you very much for this very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. It was really a pleasure. And uh, thanks on Pavel. <laughs>